Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for your yes sign. I ain't gonna talk too long. Just thank you guys for uh, uh, watching the, the videos and stuff like that. You know, drop a like, drop a like. That helps some. And uh, I'm gonna just get straight in it. This one is called Geography Now, South Africa. So we're going to go on here and YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what I've won with South Africa here. Okay, let's see if I got this. Ikaka lazi kika krika kwaze kwaka waka ukokoka ikaka la kabaleka ikrini la tibalika la kaula ukokoko. It's time to learn. What the bumble clock was that? Barbs. Once again, this shirt was made by Geography Peep Ruba from UnityShirtsShop.com. She makes these cool handmade African flag logo shirts. Oh, and uh, she specifically made this one with the Geography Now logo in the back for me. Oh, thank you, Ruba. Oh, and don't forget, you can also get Geography Now merchandise at GeographyNow.com. Just a heads up. Anyway, South Africa. This is a big one. South Africa is kind of a big deal in Africa in general. And you know what else is a big deal? Having an actual South African in the episode. Say hi to Catherine from South Africa. Come on in. My the, my people there are just the best people in the world, and it will always be home, yeah. no matter where I live. All right, well, you ready to get into this episode, Catherine? Yes. All right, let's do it. So South Africa has always played a historically imperative role when it came to expeditions from early traders. And you can probably guess why. For one, the country lies at the bottom of the continent of Africa, bi-coastal between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. In fact, the southernmost point of the African continental mainland, Cape Agulhas, has a cool spot you can check out with a plaque and a giant Africa map monument. From there, they are bordered by six other countries. Don't forget little Eswatini and the entirely enclaved country of Lesotho. Eswatini, I don't know that place. Nine provinces. The country doesn't have one official capital, but rather three. Pretoria, which holds the executive branch, including the home of the president, as well as most of the embassies for international diplomats. The legislative branch is held in Cape Town, where you can find the national parliament and second largest city in the country. And Bloemfontein, near the center of the country, hosts the judicial branch and the Supreme Court of Appeal. Some say technically Johannesburg could also be considered maybe a fourth capital because it has the constitutional court, and the city has a huge level of significance as the largest and busiest city of the country, but eh, you decide. Johannesburg also hosts the biggest and busiest airport in South Africa, OR. Tambo International, whereas the second and third largest airports lie respectively in the second and third largest cities, Cape Town and Durban's King Shaka wow. International. The country you know, has a wide network of... I don't... That's huge. I mean, I know it's big and everything, but uh, never looked at it from this perspective before. But well, that's a country that uh, we learn a lot about in, in history back home, simply because of the, 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 the struggles that we went through. And, you know, with Nelson Mandela going to jail for 30 years and then coming out and becoming president and all of that. So uh, we learn a lot about that. We heard about Soweto and uh, other places where there were like uh, uprisings and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So I know a little bit about South Africa. So. Let's keep going. Let's see what we're on here. Roadways and the most well-developed rail system in all of Africa. Johannesburg being the main central hub that spiderwebs all the other main lines that stretch into every other province and abroad into neighboring countries. South Africa also boasts incredible seafaring infrastructure with the second busiest container port in all of Africa after Port Said in Egypt. The port of Durban, which provides 60% of all South Africa's shipping revenue. Finally, South Africa's island or insular region are mostly confined to small patches along the coasts like the Port Elizabeth Bay or Robin Island just north of Cape Town, famous for being the spot where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. However, if we include the entire domain belonging to South Africa, then Prince Edward and Marion Island, which belong to the Western Cape Province, are the actual southernmost points of the African continent. These islands are mostly uninhabited, with the exception of a meteorological station and bunkers for scientists. Oh, wow. Yeah, the southernmost point on Marion Island, it's called Cape Hooker. Literally, it is. <laughs> Cape Hooker. Okay, you're probably wondering, why isn't Lesotho part of South Africa? Yeah, why? Hmm. Well, long story short, it was kind of like UK okay if you help me kick his ass, I'll be one of your protectorates you got a deal <laughs> I got him Woo. hey your king died and we want to make you a part of the Cape Colony oh no I'll just stick with protectorate well we don't like that okay well I guess that means we'll spend the next 14 years resisting and giving you a headache deal we give up we'll give you guys self-rule as a separate crown colony you guys suck but whatever it's better than being part of the Cape Colony 
South Africa is now going to become its own country, and we want you to be in it. Oh, hell no. Oh, come on. We're going to have very tense, racially divisive apartheid policies that will disenfranchise your people. Okay, how do you see that as conducive to the benefit of my people? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't. All right. Well, enjoy your self-rule. And from there, it pretty much sealed the deal that Lesotho would never you know, go to South Africa. Come to think of it, uh, it's kind of like how it happened. You know what I mean? It's like when those when the colonizers they just left. Now some stick around. I know the British stuck around uh, in Grenada and on, on some of the other islands, and you know, even to this day, they're still around to a certain degree. But a lot of the colonies, and I, I, I assume this is what happened in throughout history is they just leave the colonies to govern themselves without really teaching them how to govern themselves according to their political structure because then you need that political structure for you know to trade you know and and have diplomatic relations and stuff like that you know what i mean so if you have a let's say an archaic look at things then you're going to suffer and I guess Haiti is one of the best uh, examples of that, you know, they, they had the revolution and it's like, let's just punish them for a few years and not give them anything, you know, or give them very little. They want to govern themselves, let them govern themselves and, you know, just let them lay there, you know. But uh, but that was Haiti, I do believe, was a French, but, you know, the, the British sort of stuck around because I remember uh, as a kid growing up on the island, we used to have uh, the... The, the British Navy ships coming in, you know what I mean? And all of that coming in there. And even the Queen came to visit at one point. And I, as a matter of fact, I saw a video here recently, I guess it was a year or two ago, where one of uh, the princes were playing soccer on the beach in the Caribbean, in Grenada, with some kids and stuff like that. So they didn't exactly just left. We did get some help from them because our test course, is, uh, our test used to come from there. The, Oh, man, what did they call that? O levels and A levels came from England, you know what I mean? And later on, we had our own system of tests and stuff like that. But let's go ahead. It's just the similarities, you know, between us and Africa, depending on who colonized that area. Anyway. Now, here's the interesting thing. Even though South Africa is a republic, the constitution includes the traditional leadership clause, which recognizes the certain indigenous monarchs. Yeah, today there are about 13 monarchs from nine different ethno-linguistic groups and tons of other smaller paramounts and high chiefs in South Africa. Although they do not have direct legislative power to the republic, they have a high degree of regional influence and involvement in communal affairs. Sadly, shortly before filming this episode, Zulu King Goodwill's Welitini passed away. He ruled for five decades and had a huge role of significance in the Zulu community. Wow, he was a king. A king. Well, in any case, let's talk about some of the top notable spots and let's have South African influencer and travel writer Gofari do it for us. Gofari, take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Gofari, Ooh, a South African Gofari. travel blogger, and I'm going to talk you through the notable sites to visit in South Africa. So I'm going to talk you through the cultural and the man-made sites. We have Blokrans Bridge, which is the highest bridge bungee in the world. We also have many theme parks like Gold Reef City, the Palace of the Lost City and Ushaka Marine World, Ponte Tower, District 6 Museum, the world's largest pineapple, the Big Hole, Orlando Towers, Boabab Tree Bar. We have Ooh. 10 UNESCO World Heritage Sites such as Mapungubwe and also Robben Island, which is where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. Thank you. Thanks, Gofari. You are awesome. Check out her Instagram and pages in the links in the description below. But yeah, South Africa's natural wonders, you won't even know where to begin with. Like they have the largest cave system in Africa, the Congo Caves, Borkslax Potholes, the tallest waterfalls in Africa, and it just goes on and on. Whoa, whoa, hold your horses, Catherine. That's the nature stuff. You're going to, f that's, we're gonna talk about that in the next segment. We'll, we'll uh, uh, the next segment, which is so South Africa. One word: blessed. For one, the country is a low-risk malaria nation, and most areas in the wilderness don't even require medication. They even have their own unique biome called Feinbos, the smallest and the richest of the six floral kingdom in the world, only found in southern Africa with over 6,000 endemic plant species, including the national flower, which is the king protea. Mm. When I think of South Africa, that's what I see in my mind always. Specifically Feinbos. Specifically Feinbos, yes. Mm. It's also home to the rooibos plant, where rooibos tea comes from, and that's my favorite tea. Mm. Rooibos. 
Yes, it's amazing. The Reddit. Overall, you literally can't find anywhere that looks like Don't that. Don't want to try it. For one, the country is unlike any other nation in that it's not only the southernmost portion of the East African Rift, but the entire country is kind of split between a semicircle mountain range known as the Great Escarpment. It feeds into the tallest range, the Drakensberg Mountains, in the east where you can find the tallest peak, Mafadi, shared with Lesotho. These mountains Above are the also clothes. the source of the longest river in the country, the Orange River, which ends in the Atlantic Ocean. South Africa doesn't have many large natural lakes, and the majority of inland bodies of water are man-made reservoirs, the largest one being the Harip Dam, located in the center of the country. The largest natural freshwater lake, though, is speculated to be Sibai, part of KwaZulu-Natal's Greater St. Lucia Wetland Park on the East Coast, a UNESCO heritage site. If you zoom out a little bit, you'll notice the Great Escarpment has these sharp, narrow, parallel wrinkles at the bottom. These are called the Cape Mountains, which are essentially leftover sediments smashed by contrasting tectonic activity long ago, when South Africa was connected to Argentina and Antarctica in the Gondola oh, wow. supercontinent. The, 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 Above it, these wrinkles... Isn't that cool how everything was connected. Hmm. I wonder if, every, if everything was connected like that. How human beings, like if everything, what was that called? Uh, Plangia? Is that what that's called? Correct me in the bottom there. You know, I'm, I'm going way back to remember that there. But what what kind of world would it be if everything was connected? You know what I mean? Like people in the middle would probably never see the ocean. You know. It's, I'm just babbling here. Let's let, let's go. Let's go. You have the Great Karoo, Namakaland, Bushmanland, and Kalamari, which are dry, arid, rocky areas, sparsely populated and loaded with rich flora of succulent plants Ooh. and minerals. If you move more east and north of the escarpment, you have the Eastern Midlands, KwaZulu Natal Coast, sweeping up to the Lowveld and the Limpopo Lowveld in the north. These are the most Limpopo. lush and green areas of South Africa and hold much of the arable land as well as nature and forest preserves. When you move inland, though, you get the high velds, the Bushveld and Hrika land west, which are the arid savannas of South Africa. This is probably one of the most unique areas of South Africa because it is the site where two things happened. One, an enormous meteor hit this spot, creating the largest verified impact crater on Earth, known as the Fredford Crater, standing over 300 kilometers wide. You can even see the dome from space at the town of Fredford. And two, said meteor was supposedly the source of many minerals like gold and platinum that fed the land, ah. which later the inhabitants would subsequently discover and go crazy after in a mad gold rush and mining rush. Now, although South Africa is the second largest economy in Africa after Nigeria, it is ranked the most industrialized, technologically advanced, and economically diversified. And although the country does have a wide income gap between the wealthy and poor, the middle class has been growing every year since the 90s. Today, South Africa is one of the world's top platinum and chromium producer. They consistently rank in the top 10 producers of gold and diamonds as well. And finally, the gold rush in Vidbata Strand in 1886 pretty much established the country as a mineral powerhouse. That's why it's only about 5% of the population is formally in employed in farming. This means they've shifted much of their economic activity towards other sectors like manufacturing, business, and finance. Today, JSE Limited is the largest stock exchange in Africa, ranking 17th in the world with over trillions of dollars of investment revenue. You so know, moving from agricultural to industrial, is the, yeah, that helps you compete with the rest of the world. But is there some effect in how the gap of uh, wealth is i mean because think about it like a poor tribesman he's not gonna be able to how should i put it participate in the industrialization especially if those tribesmen want to keep their culture because if they become industrialized then you have all these other people coming in and diluting the culture you know what i mean and when you live in a concrete jungle there's not real culture in a concrete jungle because it's so diverse. You know what I mean? So you're going to have a mishmash of cultures and stuff like that. Now, I'm not so sure what the population in South Africa is like. I know it's diverse to a certain degree, but being such a a hub of, of uh, economy, you know what I mean? It's a developing country or is it considered a developed country? No, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look that up. But, you know, the struggle to keep tradition and stuff must be really, you know, okay, you have tradition and you have progress. Because in some cases, progress is not the best thing for a culture or a people. That's an, you know what I mean? And that's just anywhere in the world. It's not just Africa. That's in Europe, you know, in Asia, you know, all over the place.
South Africa also boasts some of the best medical facilities in Africa and has the third largest hospital in the world. Sadly, wow. South Africa does have the highest population of people infected with HIV at over 7.5 million and it's fourth Whoa. in the world per population ratio. There's even a character on their version of Sesame Street who has HIV to help kids born with AIDS to cope. And finally, the country has a huge tourism industry, mostly in the nature areas. Speaking of nature, it's time for Gary Harlow to explain. Gary Harlow's Animal Adventure. That's the best I got. South Africa is home to over 20 national parks and dozens of nature reserves. The most famous and visited ones being the Table Mountain National Park and the largest one, Kruger National Park in the Northeast. South Africa is ranked the sixth out of the 17 classified mega diverse countries in the world. Tenth for plant species and third for marine endemism. In fact, between May to July, the sardine run happens in which billions of sardines spawn in the cool waters of the Agulis I, I like the taste of sardines. a feeding frenzy for all the ocean predators. Look at them go, chomping. See, that's nature. Jaws. <laughs> And there's over 850 sink. bird species, including the national bird, the blue crane. But more interesting, South Africa and Namibia are the only two countries in Africa that host penguins. The endangered African or Cape penguin is unique in that it has pink glands above its eyes to help regulate body temperature. Since South Africa is generally much warmer than the typical habitat for penguins like, you know, Antarctica. There's nearly 300 mammal species inhabiting the wilderness. Including the national animal, the spring that's a, that's there's a even majestic an entire animal. national park dedicated to elephants in the south. And finally, South Africa is not only home to many animals, but also extinct animal fossils. The Karoo region has more dinosaur fossil sites than any other place in the country, and numerous dinos have been excavated. <laughs> and speaking of dinos, I got a velocity. Wrap this up. Thank you, Gary. And speaking of rats, that, that girl looks, looks like a friend of mine. What, whoa, what's going on? Oh, I should say that young lady. Food. All right, Excuse me. Let's roll. South Africa has so many unique dishes, but one thing is guaranteed. You will see meat on almost every menu. No shocker, they are the largest meat producer in Africa. In any case, here are some of the top dishes you guys suggested. Poppenborst, milk tart, fricadelle, mm -hmm. bunny chow, cook sisters, malva pudding, porky kos, fat cakes, mopani worms, savory pies, Cape Malay curry, babua tea, biltong. The Western Cape province has some of the most refined wineries what? in the world. Starting what? all the way back to 1659. And supposedly what? Route 62 is the longest wine route Plus in the world, the wine and 850 thing. kilometers long. And of course, many might argue the national dish would be braai, or South African style barbecue, cooked over wood flames. Whoa, Noah, Ooh, you're back. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks, Noah. Wood flames. Right. And don't forget to get some burgers from Wimpy's and a rib meal from Sears on Wacky Wednesday. Wacky and make Wednesday. sure that you go to Spur. Spur has the two for one special on Mondays. <laughs> and speaking of the she knows it all. Oh, I think that means we should probably move on to the next segment. The. Now, I asked you guys, the South African Jagger peeps, what it means to be South African. And here are some things you guys said. Being a South African is very nice because we have so many different types of uh, traditional groups where everyone is celebrating. We come from a beautiful country. We're full of cultural diversity. And of course, we truly epitomize the Rainbow Nation. To be South African means to live in the most beautiful country in the world and to be part of the most vibrant and energetic group of people. We're quite resilient when it comes to the challenges we face as well they have got a strong, strong sense of pride living in a post-apartheid era um, i feel that we have a lot of unity we have a lot of strength and we are really heroes for the challenges that we face every week and that we overcome and we always find a way to remain you see this is a reason why i like to hear it from the people who are born in the place and who are living in those places. I don't want to hear the media telling me this about the place or, or this person who went on a missionary trip telling me about the place because they tell it from their own cultural perspective or their own religious perspective or their own political perspective. You see, these when you hear about Africa, you think the worst right off the bat. You know what I mean? Even as a kid, we'd make, you know, we used to hear people talk about, you know, the Ethiopian crisis back in the 70s where, you know, there was farming and starvation and stuff. And all you've seen is those pictures. And those pictures still linger. Those pictures still linger. You know what I mean? But then, and this is the reason why, you know what I mean? If a country is developing, you got to talk to the people who are developing with it. Nice little segue there. But anyway, let's keep watching. I mean, it's diverse. You know what I mean? Uh... 
that guy looked like the wrestler Edge. <laughs> in the game and strong. It's an absolute miracle. If you got to see the 2019 Rugby World Cup in Japan and seeing how diverse and incredible uh, South African, um, you know, athletes were, it's ever changing. It's always evolving. So many different art movements and interesting things going on. It's an incredible thing. I am especially making me want to visit. Of the fact that I don't have to travel far to experience something different. Each of its nine provinces are so unique in their landscapes, in their cultures, in their flavors. So it's that. That's what makes it such a fun and exciting place to be. Thank you, guys. What about you, Catherine? Well, I would say that every weekend is a jaw. Jaw? What was that? Jaw. What is that? So if you're going to go for a jaw, you're going to go for a party, and it's going to be like a really insane night. Like, you're, if you're going to go jaw, you're going to go like really hard that night. Hmm, okay. Now, as you will find out, South Africa is very diverse in terms of ethno-linguistic people groups. Let's start with a pie chart, shall we? The country has about 60 million people and has the largest white and Asian populations and percentages per population in all of Africa. The country is made up predominantly of black Africans at about 80%. However, keep in mind of this 80%, there are many groups. Zulus and Kosa are the largest ones at about 23% and 16%, followed by the Northern Sutu and Swana at about 9% and 8%. And from there, there's a bunch of other groups, but we'll talk about them later in this episode. For the remaining 20% of the population, the white South Africans and coloreds have almost identical populations at somewhere around 9% each. Keep in mind, though, amongst the white population, can you imagine how many uh, how many tribes and stuff, and not just in Africa, but in Asia and in, uh, even in Europe, you know, because, you know, there's different uh, ethno, ethnic groups there. How many tribes have actually died out? You know, the other night I was thinking and I wanted to write a book. And the idea is the last person alive from a specific tribe of people. You know what I mean? But this last person actually knows the history and knows all of that. So who does he pass it down to? Because if he marries somebody outside of the tribe, which is what's going to happen, what's going to happen? What are they going to teach them? Is that going? To, you know what I'm saying? If it's a man or a woman, you know, how are they going to teach? You know, how are they going to keep their their tribe? history going there's just so many tribes or, or or sex of people that's probably just became extinct that would be a nice little story to tell for a lack of better words population about 60 percent of them are afrikaners and 35 percent are english the remaining five or so percent being other europeans the rest of the population is mostly made up of asians like indians malays chinese and so on so they use the South African Rand as their currency and they also use the M plug outlet and they also drive on the left side of the road. Left, former British colony. Yep. Mm. And also, Same way. 80% of the country Same is way back at home. adhering to Protestantism. So first off, let's clarify some confusing distinctions. So you heard that word, colored. Okay, we Americans might have some horrible pre-civil rights flashbacks when we hear that word, but we assure you, it's totally safe to use here in South Africa, right? Yeah. It is totally <laughs> safe. And I actually did use that word a few times in America, and I didn't know what I was doing until one of my friends that was American, he actually pulled me aside and he was like, No. <laughs> now, there's no complete definitive genetic makeup requirement but color people are essentially people that are mixed mostly between blacks and whites although you can also have some hey, in there's this well. it's not uncommon that guy basically that yes after all the mixing they kind of just made a new race Sarah Tishkoff, a geneticist at the University of Pennsylvania, did a genetic study that concluded that the Cape Colors of South Africa have the highest levels of mixed ancestry in the world. So yeah, they're literally the children of the earth. And that other word, Afrikaner, what is that? Well, long story short, they're descended from the people brought in by the Dutch settlers in the 1600s. Keep in mind though, only about 40% of Afrikaners are directly Dutch descended and the rest were mostly German and French. Dutch and Afrikaans are about 90 to 95% mutually intelligible. South South Africa has about 35 indigenous languages, but 11 official languages. Anyway, these 11 languages are divided into five families. And of the languages, English is the preferred language of the intercommunication between all peoples. And most South Africans are fluent in at least two or three languages. You wow. Understand Afrikaans, right? Yes. Yep. Is it kind of like really appreciated when a black South African sees a white South African speaking their language? Yeah. Oh, it absolutely is. And that's something that I have not mastered. We are taught Kosa in school, for example. It, it, it isn't to the degree that Afrikaans is, is taught. You don't really become fluent. Like I can understand certain things, but not a lot. Yeah, I think uh, Port Elizabeth was changed to Kaipela yes, or something was. like that. Exactly. Yeah. 
exactly. You said that good. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing that was good. Yeah. And yes, many of the Muni languages like Zulu and Kosa have the click sounds. And mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's yeah, that's, the, that's a language I'm he really, really, I want to experience that language. Believe it or not, the they're not the original inhabitants of South Africa. Archaeological evidence suggests that they migrated somewhere estimated around the 3rd century AD. The Khoi Khoi and San people, often collectively called the Khoi San. I was reading some, somewhere where it said the Bantus are like pretty much the descendants are pretty much all over Africa. And the, and, and there's a, there's a, what you call it, the it seems like they have transcended Africa and there's some in South America too, you know, so a lot of people are sort of descendants of the Bantus. And I just learned that, guess where I learned that from? Doing these videos. That's where I learned that from. Uh, I was, uh, there was a guy that told me about the Bantus and I didn't know nothing about them and I went and I did some little, a little research and Fungus make up less than one percent of the population today, and they are the earliest known inhabitants with ancestors Not if I was wrong. somewhere around one hundred thousand years, Slap me making around. them speculated to be some of the oldest peoples on Earth. They have the original click languages. Quick history lesson: Over time, the Bantus came in and dominated with their iron tools and farming practices. And although they displaced many of the Khoisan, anthropologists and sociologists speculate that there must have been some intermingling because the click consonants were adopted in their languages. Over a millennium later, the Dutch were first Europeans to come in and establish Cape town and then brought in their farmers known as Boers. Meanwhile, hundreds of miles east, Shaka Zulu was unifying most of the Nguni tribes in the early 19th century and drove out many of the rival tribes like the Matabele, Makololo, and the Fengu. This was known as the Mpetane, or the Great Crushing and Displacement. Enter the British. This is where the story gets really complicated, so here's a quick cutaway to help. I'm taking Cape Town while well, the Netherlands has problems in Europe. Well, I'm just gonna go run away then and make my own republics in the north. <laughs> Out. You're not even from this continent. Make me. Oh, I'll make you. Oh, hey. Get the bollocks. There's like a ton of gold and diamonds in your new republic areas. Move over. Hell no. Yeah, there's a lot more that goes into that, but basically it was a chain of weird multi-leveled, multi-party, multi-ethnic battles and subjugation. In addition to the countless native Bantus killed in wars, there were two Boer wars between the British and Afrikaners, which led to 10% of the white Afrikaner population being killed. So you had one European power subjugating another European group on a continent neither were native to, all dealing with the natives. So in a nutshell, I want the land. I was here centuries before you. I was here over a millennium before you. Seriously, are we really doing this? In any case, after the country gained independence in 1910 as a union and fully sovereign in 1931, it underwent a controversial period of apartheid or apartheid in 1948 all the way up to 1990. Apartheid. This system That's... essentially divided peoples by racial lines and put strict laws that were obviously racist and not like, you know, equivalent to, you know, certain extreme factions of microaggression culture that blames pretty much everything on racism. I mean, like literally it was actually written approved and enacted in legal policy racist. Under the homeland system, most of the black population was concentrated in the ethno states called Bantustans, where only 13% of the land was reserved for the majority of the black populace to have property in. Rules and services were different for colored people as well, like and the Asian minorities. It was very complicated and often arbitrarily drawn. Some of the colored people were allowed in parliament in the 70s and some weren't. Some minorities were labeled in the same group as coloreds, while some like the Lebanese, Taiwanese, Koreans, Japanese, they all shared actually the same classification level for whites it was confusing and weird yeah eventually after a number of factors pressured them apartheid ended with full democratization for blacks in 1994 and that's when so you see that that's just kind of strange you know they, they, like in somebody's country and you really get them to the the lowest pretty much and then you have all these other people coming in and you say well you you, you you're uh, hey you, you're basically at the same level as I am. You know what I mean? But I'm, I'm going to say something that's probably going to make people go, what are you talking about? Listen, listen, listen. Here is it. This is human beings. And you know me. I'm big on the human vibe, okay? If the tables were turned, I do believe that, that the Africans would enslave the, the Europeans because that's human vibe there. You know what I mean? That, that's just the way it is, you know? And they, and they probably did to some extent, but there's no written history of it. And I know some people are going to go, what are you talking about, blah, blah, blah. And the point is we're human. And if we see stuff that's going to get us ahead and make things better for us, because, I mean, they were doing it to each other. Just like in Europe, they were doing it to each other there. 
you know what I mean? They would conquer places and enslave the people there. So it's a human thing. How we change that mindset? We gotta get rid of the greed for one, you know, and then we have to stop having each other believe that the other is less than. Like I don't believe I'm more than anybody else. I'm taller than most people. <laughs> I don't know all all you have a height envy and take, you know what I mean? But it, you know what I'm saying? If the tables were turned, it would, it would be the same. We'd be, we'd be talking about a whole different thing now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, certain groups just pounced on it faster than others. Things got very incredibly tense. See, in Africa, a transition of power like that usually goes one of two ways. One, a spiteful uprising from the native black population built on vengeance that seeks to dispose most of the white population and expropriate everything from them. Or, number two, find a way to move forward as one people with a new system built on forgiveness, acknowledging that it will be awkward and difficult, but peace cannot come from a bitter heart. Today, of course, it's still a very complicated issue and there's no universal narrative and everyone agrees with. And yes, controversial in Incidents still occur. Crime is still high in certain areas due to social stress and poverty. And yes, there's the whole BEE movement thing, which started as a program aimed to integrate the black population into the workforce, but it has a lot of controversial undertones and with implementation. I'm sure you could probably say a lot of stuff about that, yes. you and the other South Africans. Then there's the energy crisis or load shedding issue. You'll actually wake up in the morning and you'll get a message on your phone because we have an app that will tell you it's from 6 a.m. to maybe like 2 p.m. You won't have any energy at all. At least they have an app that Wow. <laughs> so. That's new. That's new. We didn't always have that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. very recent. They're working on our it. Our thing. <laughs> but the point is there's so On the island, our thing was water. I remember growing up on the southern tip of the island. Now, when you live in the city, you don't have that issue. But if you grow up on the southern tip of the island, you get running water through your tap for an hour. So you have to fill up a tank in the backyard and that's how we this is big tank that's how we got all that's how we uh we uh we took our showers from there and stuff like that to use in the in the bathroom itself in the shower itself you know so it's a kind of a similar stuff and we also had a, a power outage where whoop, everything goes black black out you know what i mean so is it a british colony thing <laughs> i'm just being silly much stuff if you guys want to write about it in the comments if you're from south africa i implore you to have a civil discussion which i know on youtube is almost impossible but i don't know True. watch maybe invictus if you want to get an idea i've been lucky so it. far oh, and uh speaking of invictus let's move on to a lighter note let's talk about the sports here's arts with the sports part hey guys Whoa. hey guys <laughs> hey guys it's me and tarchin we're back all right, I gotta put Tarchin down so we can start. Specifically rugby. Their national team, the Springboks, have won the World Cup three times, tied with New Zealand. In fact, South Africa is one of only two countries that has hosted the soccer, rugby, and cricket World Cricket Cups. man. In fact, they are actually the only Afri- Cricket, the gentleman's sport. <laughs> They'd stop at 3 p.m. for a cup of tea and some crumpets. I love cricket, man. I watch cricket still, you know what I mean? The IPL in India and stuff. See the similarities? They're way over there. we way down on this side. And we have, uh, we play soccer. We play cricket. We're not big on rugby. I don't remember too many people playing a lot of rugby. They played some, but not much. But, you know, whatever country colonized uh, other place, their uh, culture and sports sort of, you know, sort of sinks into the local tradition, culture, and stuff like that. African country to host the Soccer World Cup so far. Fun fact, South Africans are actually one of the only countries that, like us Americans, also call football soccer. Cheers to you guys. Soccer. I didn't know what it makes no sense. sense but Dude, together. when I come here and everybody's talking about soccer, soccer, soccer talking about you know what i mean and then they say they go to a football game and i see them grab the ball and run and they have helmets and so it's like, wait a minute they ain't kicking the ball one man kicked the ball there so i don't know what they would call it if they didn't call it football but i know football a soccer i didn't know what soccer was until i came in and everything is soccer soccer what are you talking about 
in her wrongness. Otherwise, cricket is probably the third most popular sport, and their national team, the Proteus, usually ranks in the world's top 10 best Little. teams. Otherwise, at the Olympics, they've done pretty well in the swimming and athletics department, racking up 26 gold medals so far. Gold is better than silver. They've also been tennis powerhouses as well. Johan Creek won two Australian I remember him. slam titles in the 80s. That's a big deal. In certain areas, you might find Johan a touch Creek. of Dutch with things like corf ball. Also originating in South Africa, Africa is ring ball, which is basically another variation of court no, ball. Don't they play net ball too? Yukske is a traditional Afrikaner sport similar to horseshoes in ball. which you have to knock over a peg. On For those of you who don't know what net ball is, it's like female basketball. Basketball for women, I guess. But the rim is 12 feet up and there's no backboard and they don't dribble. They just two steps pass, two steps pass. And they have like a, this. And they, I know they have a World Cup. Ever, I don't know how ever, how many years apart, but I know they do. I love that game. It's called netball. And I know South Africa had to distance. play it. And many of the native peoples have their own style of martial arts. The most renowned probably being the Nuni stick fighting or Donga, performed mostly by the Zulu or the Alt. <laughs> I can't. Do oh. So that's where that came from. When I was a kid, we have a carnival that we have on the island. And they used to have these people that had these stick fighting uh, performances. You know what I mean? And even sometimes when they have the uh, show, uh, because we used to showcase our African heritage a lot, they, they, they have these stick fighting. And it used to be back in the day that it was real, that they actually beat each other with these sticks. You know, it wasn't like a, a performance. It was a fight. You know what I mean? So... So we come from the Zulu vibe, yeah. So that's what it is. That was horrible. Both that people. That was better, yeah. Okay. And that's it for me. I'm gonna get the out of here. I'll see ya. Thank you, Art. And South Africa is also really well known for its surfing. And if you ever just want to watch a competition and have a great Joel, you can go Joel. to Jay Bay. Yes, exactly. There's That's that what it would happen. So, as we mentioned, South Africa has a huge diversity of ethno-linguistic people groups. We already made a video explaining about some of them, but let's just quickly cover the main ones. First, you have the Nguni group. This group includes Nguni. the cousins of Zulus, Osas, and the Ndebele peoples. Zulus are probably the most well-known worldwide. You may have seen images of their traditional animal skin warrior attire or weaponry and dance ceremonies for the men. Women often wear those wide conical Ooh, yeah. hats on special occasions. For the Kosa, they are kind of like the pacifist Ziv siblings of the Zulu. Man. Their traditional garbs have those black and white patterns. Those traditional garbs are gorgeous. Blanket coverings. Indibele are like the Wait a minute. Known for the you know what that reminds me of? Houses and red ochre dyed blanket This here covered. reminds me a little bit of a uh, South American uh, indigenous people wear. In some places, I guess. I guess the patterns and stuff are different, but the style is kind of similar. Comment down below. Tell me if I'm being silly. Brings. Indibele are like the artists, known for their colorful patterns, painted houses. The symbols are unique to each family. And they are also the bead experts, and they'll flaunt heavy beaded neck and leg ornaments on special occasions. Finally, the Swazi people basic, are basically cousins to the people of the Eswatini, known for honoring their kings with Mflanga or reed dance. Then we have the Sutu group, made up of the Sutu, the Tswana, and the Sepedi peoples. They all are relatives to the people well, of the city of Tswana, and many of them are mountain people. You can see lots of them riding horses and wearing makarotlo hats and basutu blankets as temperatures are generally colder with high elevations. The Swana people have eight major clans and they love the color blue, especially with the Latishi cloth. The Songa are known for their many, many initiation rituals and electric dance style or Songa disco. The Venda people are some Songa of the most disco. isolated groups in the north, famous for their natural medicines and the Masangwe or bare knuckle fist fight sport, which people use to kind of like monitor and solve disputes. Now for non-Africans, we already explained about the white South Africans. The Afrikaners and the English are unique in the way that they kind of develop their own breakaway Africanized culture from the European ancestors. What are you, by the way? I'm English. Oh, okay. I yeah. am an English through and through. The colored community has always kind of had a unique status as the somewhat marginalized, but not as marginalized. Trevor group. Noah. They always kind of had to figure out who they were since they technically didn't fully belong anywhere. It's, yeah. Then you have the Asian community, the largest groups being of the Cape Malays and the Indians, brought over during colonial times for their indentured servitude. The 
Burkhardt neighborhood of Cape Town is a center Ooh, look at the colors. Water, and today their culture is a fascinating mixture that blends elements of Dutch and Asian. In fact, most of them actually speak Afrikaans as their first language and the Malay language is almost all but gone. The Indian community was brought in by the British and Durban has one of the highest population of Indians outside of India. Most were brought over from West and South India, including Gandhi who spent 21 years living in the area. Oh wow, yeah, that was a lot. didn't know that. I've been scratching the surface. There's so many other people who but I know he, talk about. But in any case, just head up to explain a little Indians bit more about the few uh, things that South, South Africa's Africa. people have collectively as one entity, one entity, eternity. <laughs> you get the point. Hannah's culture segment. Random Hannah. Hello, Hello Hannah. Hannah. Guys, get a random Hannah shirt at geographynow.com. So, all right, obviously there is no such thing as a single type of South African, but in the end, they are still one country that moves forward to the best of their ability. For one, many of the native ethnic groups, Good whether Zulu or Venda, follow the Labola system, in which the groom must pay a dowry in cattle to the bride's family. I love the countries where they pay people with cattle. Remember Rwanda? Yes, I freaked out. I was like, what? There is literally a Labolo app available now to help relieve the stress of figuring how many cattle you owe. Township art became very popular in the 60s and 70s. It was sort of a social commentary movement that depicted the impoverished black communities of South Africa to move towards the end of apartheid. In addition, you will notice there are so many different architecture styles in South Africa. You have everything from the massive thatched fortified dome huts of Zulu to the Cape Dutch style homes inspired from the Dutch with flat crow stacked table okay. roofs. Okay, South you Africa got me. I want to go see it. Runners and many inventions, discoveries, and innovations. For example, the automatic pool cleaner, the CAT scan, putty adhesive, the smart lock safety scan. syringe, the world's first heart transplant happened here, the yellow fever vaccine, and they have the biggest optical telescope in the southern hemisphere. And so, what, what else? Fun fact, being South African means knowing the difference between now, 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 and just now. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Jay. South Africa has also been the location shot of many feature films and TV shows. Everything from the debuting film, The Gods Must Be Crazy, Sorry. and the award winner, Sotsi, which I actually watched last night. Amazing movie. Academy Award nominated District 9 and Chappie. And of course, Mandela Long Walk to Freedom. What's your seen, oh, I've seen most of those. There's some amazing comedy, which I feel like people don't talk about that much. I've been watching a lot of Leon Schuster movies. Yeah. And finally, we'll the check one some of these thing out. that unifies all South Africans is Heritage Day, in which people are encouraged to wear their traditional costumes and express their background. And everyone joins in a bride together, no matter who you are. You Usually the festivals include an abundance of music. So to expound more on that, here's Keith. Blah, blah, blah. Wait, Keith isn't here. How's he gonna be in this video? Hannah, I'm in Florida. And guess what? You can't cancel me? Anyways, South Africa. They have so much going on. Even their national anthem is sung in five different languages. Basically from the beginning, traditional vocals were used along with the marimba, the yuhadi, the kora, and other assorted hand drums and harps. The first style of music to really take over the world, probably Marabi. Now, Marabi started out in the slums of Johannesburg. And Marabi is a style of music that is basically underground swing jazz. From there, world-renowned artists such as Soweto Gospel Choir and Lady Smith Black Mombazo have put Mombazo. South Africa on the map. Every South African will definitely know Johnny Clegg, the white Zulu who wrote songs in Zulu to criticize apartheid. Today, South Africa is known predominantly for its popularity in house music, and more specifically for the subgenres of Guam and I'm a piano? I'm, I'm a piano. You guys told us to definitely mention those styles of music. Some other South African artists that you may be familiar with are Diane Wood for their crazy hip hop, South African-y fusion style of music. You guys might know Synth Peter, who I think has one of the greatest songs ever written. It's called Doof Doof. You should all go chant to Doof Doof. Yeah, yeah, that's it for me. Hope you guys had a good one, and back to you, Paul! Thank you, Keith. All right, so this is the part where we talk about some of the famous people of South Africa, and here's South African geography, Kolo, to explain. All right, South Africa is as talented as it is diverse. A few notable South Africans that you geography peeps might be familiar with include 
Charlize Theron, John Carney, Trevor Noah, Shoto Kobli, Gugum Bata Ro, Demi Lee Peters, Zozibenzi Tunzi, and last but not least, business magnate Elon Musk. There are a number of South Africans who've excelled in different fields across the decade. Didn't know he was South African. Charlize Theron. Thank you, Kolo. All right, and with that, we got to move on to the next segment. Uh, this video is getting kind of long. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you ready? Yeah. All right, let's talk about the friends of South Africa. <laughs> So South Africa and their click, who's in and who's close? Well, it really depends on where you want to start on the globe, but put in a nutshell. As a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, of course, South Africa has always had many ties to their Anglophone counterparts. New Zealand and Australia are kind of like the Southern Hemisphere trio that dominate the Tropic of Capricorn. These three have been trading and assisting each other for centuries and have friendly competitions. There was a bit of tension in the past, though, since many white South Africans choose to move to these countries in fear of policies they think might target them in South Africa. It got uh. to the point where an Australian cabinet member even refer to them as refugees, which cause some backlash. But apart from that, overall, these three get along great. South Africa is also a member of the BRICS nations, the Association of Emerging Economies being Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Together, these five have about a quarter of the world's land and about 40% of the world's population. They maintain a non-interference policy with mutual benefit plans. As a former British and Dutch colony, obviously the UK and Netherlands have cordial ties. Many South Africans visit or live in these countries. Interestingly, though, despite a heavy usage of the Afrikaans language, South Africa has rejected all offers to join the Dutch language union and today stands in special partner status along with Indonesia. If you ask who South Africa's best friends are though, you'd probably have to head a little closer home. Today, despite being fully independent sovereign nations, South Africans usually don't even see Lesotho or Eswatini as separate countries. South Africa even has more Sotho and Swazi people than the entire population of each country. Oh, Same wow. for the Swana people of Botswana. So they get these countries. In addition, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Namibia are also in the core group. They share a lot of the same ethnic groups like the Shona, Tsonga, and Khoisan. Granted, yes, there was a little bit of tension with Zimbabwe when they called for economic sanctions against South Africa during apartheid, and South Africa was pissed that Zimbabwe was hosting guerrilla rebels, and they didn't really like Zimbabwe's expropriation laws that kind of kicked out almost their entire white population, but nonetheless, they have good relations. As for Namibia, they actually were a part of South Africa until gaining independence in 1990, so there's a significant historical tie. Today, a huge portion of Namibia's economy is tied with South Africa. They even accept the South African rand as legal tender, and overall, they just really like each other. Nelson when they Mandela is on their money. Hmm. I think uh, you should take it away, Catherine. I'm out. So South Africa, I feel, is super unique in the way that we connect with one another. The words that we use, the lingo, just everything is very different to anything I've ever experienced in, in another country. I feel like South Africa is just like Fembos in the way that it's not seen anywhere else in the world. I like that. It's like Fembos. Nowhere else on earth. And stay tuned. Spain is coming up next. <laughs> just did Spain. But I'm telling you, uh, it's amazing how far apart we are but culturally sort of the same but because of the 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 slaves that went there and, and the whole uh, uh kinship with africa because i know in, in on my island man they, they, they preach a lot of africanism on my island you know what i mean we still have the the same sort of dress we still wear dashikis and stuff on the island. Or I don't know where the dashikis is from. I don't. I know it's African origin, but we still wear Africanized clothes. Uh, not all the time. And whenever we have a carnival, when I was growing up, I don't know how they do it now, and I, I, I could still see some of the remnants of the Africanism in the carnival. But uh, uh, when I was growing up, when we had the carnival, they have what you call bands. And in the bands, you have different sections. And they used to have these uh, sections depicting different African tribes. You know what I mean? It was kind of cool. It was You go out on your party. It's a party. You, just, you just drink, you have fun and stuff. But you learn as you go along. Anyway, I ain't going to talk too long because this video was really long. I'm going to put a link in the description to this video. Go check it out. Y'all should check out Geography Now. They have some really good stuff in there of all the world. You know, We need to learn about each other so we can understand each other. Because the only thing that's different about us is the culture and everything. Human is who we all are. Listen, take care of each other, all right? Cool, right?